I invite your attention to God's Word as it is recorded for us in Romans, the 14th chapter. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister or you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we are thinking about freedom. The freedom to believe. Uh, normally I tell a joke about this time. But this morning I feel compelled to just do a few quotes that might make us think. Quotes about freedom. People demand freedom of speech as a compensation for freedom of thought, which they seldom use. Soren Kierkegaard. Who is more to be pitied, a writer bound and gagged by policemen, or one living in perfect freedom who has nothing more to say? Kurt Vonnegut. It is easy to believe in freedom of speech for those whom we agree. 
So keep fighting for freedom and justice, beloved, but don't forget to have fun doing it. Lord, let your laughter ring forth. Be outrageous, ridicule the Freddy cats, rejoice in all the oddities that freedom can produce. Molly Ivins. Interesting. All the oddities that freedom can produce. We certainly see some, don't we? And they may be saying the same about us. <laughs> Uh, you have freedom when you're easy in your, horn in your harness. That's Robert Frost. If happiness truly consisted in physical ease and freedom from care, then the happiest individual would not be either a man or a woman. It would be, I think, an American cow. William Lyon Phillips. Bill Moyers writes, freedom begins the moment you realize someone else has been writing your story and it's time you took the pen from his hand and started writing it yourself. And then Gary Paulson said, I tried to contain myself, but I escaped. <laughs> I like that one. But then here's one that really kind of goes along with our message, and it is by uh, Joyce Meyer. What's real freedom? Real freedom is being able to not have my way and still be just as happy as if I did. That's pretty profound, isn't it? Well, in three days, our nation will celebrate our independence. We call this state and status of lifestyle that we Americans enjoy freedom. Freedom in America was once characterized by Norman Rockwell, one of my favorite painters in four pictures called the Four Freedoms. And if you've never seen that, I strongly encourage you to, if you get an opportunity and you can Google it on the computer and just put in Four Freedoms, Norman Rockwell, it will pull it up and you'll see what those pictures are. And if you get the opportunity, as Angel and I did last year, to go to Stockbridge, Mass., which was his home, there is the Norman Rockwell Museum that you can see the originals. And they're absolutely beautiful. The first picture, since you can't look at it right now, I'll describe it for you, has a fellow standing to address his peers and leaders of his community. It's probably a New England town hall meeting, which I'm sure Rockwell saw many times. He is standing as a member of the audience Surrounding him are men in suits and ties. He is wearing an old leather jacket with a plaid shirt. He is obviously a blue collar worker among white collars. He has a paper sticking out of his jacket pocket and it's probably his speech but you can see that he has chosen to speak from his heart and not use it. His hands grasp the back of the pew in front of him as he stands. The picture is called Freedom of Speech. There's a second picture, and it is the profile of faces, one and older lady with uh, head bowed, granny knot in her gray hair. Beside her is a younger woman with a rosary. Around these two are younger men and women. One man is holding a Bible, another prayer book. Another is looking forward as if he is paying attention to a preacher or worship leader. The picture is called Freedom of Worship. 
The third picture is of a grandmother placing a huge turkey on the table. Lying down both sides of the frame are the faces of the children and grandchildren who sit with huge smiles looking across the table at each other. A part of Rockwell's whimsy is in the bottom right of the picture, a man is staring up like he's looking at the camera. If he were looking at a camera, because obviously there is no camera. The picture is freedom from want. The fourth picture is a young mother and father tucking their daughters into bed. The mother is gently placing the covers just beneath their chins. The father stands beside her, smiling down at his precious daughters. He has suspenders and is holding a folded newspaper. His look is pleasant contentment and confidence in their safety. The picture is freedom from fear. Now those four pictures were Rockwell's response to a State of the Union speech that, Ro that Roosevelt gave warning America of the threat that we face from the Nazi juggernaut and the imperialism of Japan. That speech was given in January of 1941. 11 months later, Pearl Harbor would be attacked by the Japanese. In the speech, Roosevelt addressed four freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. But it was not until Rockwell took those four freedoms and put them in pictures as covers of the Saturday Evening Post that the people began to understand what Roosevelt was talking about. In fact, the press is said to have basically ignored the State of the Union speech as not being that important. But Rockwell painted something. He painted the blessings of those freedoms. And it is this thing that is most vivid and, and gets our attention. Now, obviously, we don't have time to explore all four of those freedoms this morning. So I want us to just simply take the few moments that we have and to explore the possibility of the freedom to believe. You know, belief means to think, to feel, to choose, to act. So we have the freedom as Americans to do those things, to think, to feel, to choose, and to act. In fact, Stephen Carter writes, without the freedom to act, freedom of religion becomes meaningless. Now let's see how this translates into what Paul was saying to the early church about freedom. I read it for you in Romans, the 14th chapter, and I will briefly run through it. First, Paul tells the church to treat one another with respect as it relates to diversity. In other words, don't argue with people for the purposes of condemning them. That first verse that I read for you where it says, in King James it says disputations or debatable disputations is a picture of don't pass judgments on opinions. In other words, one person says, this is the way I celebrate the faith, and another person says, this is the way I celebrate the faith, as it relates to food. Now, I certainly can relate to this because I spend a lot of my time with Seventh-day Adventist in the choir group in spirit. Probably about 80% of that, of that choir, men's chorus, are Seventh-day Adventist. If you go and you worship with them, they will treat you to some lemonade, not coffee because that's caffeine, and certainly not any food that is uh, of the meat variety. They will have veggies, they will have salad, all of these kind of things. 
Now, when you are with someone who looks at life a little bit differently than you do, who are vegetarians, and I imagine most of us are omnivores, we uh, eat pretty much what is put before us, this was the problem with the early church. The Jews and the Gentiles were coming together in the early church. The Jews practiced kosher law. They did not uh, enjoy a por pork barbecue sandwich or pork loin or something like that. And yet there were other Christians who did. And there were probably some Christians who would not even eat meat, period, because they were not sure if they were doing the right thing. So Paul said we have to allow for diversity, but look instead for unity. And look at those things which bring you together, that you have all been accepted by the Lord Jesus Christ. You have all been brought into the same family. And please don't condemn another brother or sister because their beliefs are different than yours. And Paul challenges us by asking us the question, what right do we have to condemn somebody else's servant? Would you do that? Would you discipline someone else's child? Would you discipline someone else's servant or, or employee for that matter? Of course not. And he was saying, so why do we think we can do that when one is going to stand or fall in the eyes of their own master? And then he brings it back around and he says, okay, now we've looked at food, let's look at special days. Some people esteem Saturday over Sunday, don't they? And uh, what Paul says is basically the one who esteems one day does it to the Lord. And the one who esteems another day does it to the Lord. So if you're going to esteem Sunday, that means Saturday is going to be for some other purpose. If you're going to esteem Saturday, then Sunday is probably going to be for some other purpose. And so, in essence, basically what he's saying is be prepared to deal with diversity. I would hope as American citizens that part of our realizing freedom is that we realize that everybody is not going to think the way we think. They're not going to see life the same way we see life. But our respect for them will certainly be a bold testimony of what we believe is our freedom in Christ as well. And so Paul then kind of brings it all together and says, so whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. And then he winds up the message very, and I'm running quickly through it because I realize we have communion, that he says, now, You've considered food. You've considered a day. I want you to realize something, that what you should really be considering is not whether everybody agrees with you. And he calls the person the weaker brother, the one who doesn't enjoy all the benefits of the, of the food. Uh, does anyone have any doubts that Paul ate whatever he wanted to eat? You know, because he is referring to the one who doesn't as the weaker brother. But he then would tell you that he doesn't do it to flaunt his freedom in front of that brother or that sister. Because that would cause them to stumble. That would cause them to, to be hurt. And this is a brother or sister for whom Christ has died. Now, probably, you know, you've heard about eating meat offered to idols or eating a certain kind of meat or not eating meat. And those are things that people maybe debated in the first century. Today, we have different debates, don't we? You know, I, I remember growing up, uh, 
I was a Baptist, so we had a whole list of do's and don'ts. And one of them was we don't dance. You know, you just don't do that. And some people would say you don't gamble. Oh, well, you just don't do that. And some people say, well, you don't use alcohol as a beverage, because that was actually in the church covenant. And then one day I came to a startling realization that none of that is in the Bible. That is just the traditions of men. And so if a person chooses not to do those things, good. God bless you. But because if you do them and you think that they are sinful, then guess what? They are sinful for you. But if your mind is clean and your heart is clear before the Lord and you have those practices or whatever, then that's between you and God because you are the servant of the Lord and we will stand or fall in the eyes of our master. So Paul then says, so you stand or you fall in the eyes of your master and we, whether we live or whether we die, we do it all to the Lord. So don't, don't be concerned so much about whether or not someone agrees with you about the faith. Rather be more concerned that you're not using your freedom as a stumbling block against your brother. So we can go into greater clarity for that at some other time. I like the fact that the word that is used there in the Greek is the word blasphemeo from which we get our word blasphemy. In other words, that which could be good and celebrated, instead of it becoming good and celebrated, it becomes blasphemy because you're causing a brother to stumble. And then Paul winds up our teaching by saying, for the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. To know this truth is to be set free from the law of condemnation of sin and death and to truly enjoy our freedom. We will be concerned about righteousness. We will want to not just do whatever we want to do, but we will want to do the right things. And we will work for peace, and we will receive the peace of Christ, and we will, as we walk in the Spirit, discover the joy of kingdom living. May you have a glorious 4th of July. And as we celebrate this, our communion meal together, let it speak to our hearts of the freedom that we have through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has saved us from the condemnation of the law of sin and of death. Let us prepare to receive the communion.